भगवत अर्हत संबुस न मोत भगवत अर्हत संबुस न मोत भगवत अर्हत संबुस पुथंग दमंग संखंग नम सामी We're coming up to uh, Chinese New Year, which is not directly uh, attributable to the Buddha, um, but nevertheless, it's a, one of those cultural things. We have calendars: the, the Western calendar, the Chinese calendar. We have uh, New Year, the Southeast Asian New Year in April. So these days are sometimes useful for reflection on change. A new year is a new opportunity to discard uh, some of the worst things from the past. It's a time of hope. One can establish one's mind with the plan to do more good. Practice the Dhamma. Follow the Buddhist teachings in the new year. Many people like to uh, know what year it is in the Chinese calendar, so I think this year will be, be the year of the ox. And the ox does have a certain uh, <coughs> connection with the Buddhist teachings. Even the Buddha, Buddha would talk about the ox sometimes. Generally, the ox is considered to be a peaceful kind of creature, whether it's ox, cow, uh, or water buffalo. Sometimes uh, live with oxes or are used with them in farms in Asia. These large kind of creatures, which are often used for plowing and pulling carts and things, they have a very peaceful, gentle nature. Normally, <laughs> when they're not stirred up. Normally they're quite gentle, hardworking, patient. They can endure the sun, the rain, can pull heavy loads all day long. So these are qualities that are something we might aspire to in our own practice. It's not easy to be patient, gentle, and hardworking. Often hard work leads to. Uh, getting very stirred up, agitated, impatient, and you know, we can lose our temper and be very ungentle. <laughs> so sometimes it's useful to reflect on these things. I remember one time I was staying, or went to stay in a forest on the Burmese border in Thailand. Forest hermitage called Daodam which uh, is a very beautiful mountainous area right in the heart of the jungle, miles away from anywhere, and still has a lot of virgin jungle and wild animals. It's a very peaceful kind of remote place which forest monks like to go to to practice meditation. I remember one occasion a long time ago, many years ago, I went to stay there around this time in the dry season in Thailand, so around February. And uh, when I arrived, they have a, a small opening in the forest, which is like the central area where you arrive. There's just a, a very poor track through the forest to get there, which needs a four-wheel drive. You can't get an ordinary car there. Uh, and then there's a 
area on the hills with a few, just a few huts, but where most monks will camp. You make a bamboo bed and you just put up a mosquito net and stay out in the forest and get the flavour of the forest. You're exposed to the elements, whether it's hot, cold, wet, windy. You're exposed to the insects, the animals, any disease, they have malaria there. So although it's a very beautiful and peaceful place, it's quite, um, uh, can be quite challenging for many people. And generally the monks stay on top of the, the hill and they walk down a waterfall every morning to come and collect food. And that walk itself is at least one or two kilometers. The path is quite steep and tricky. So you have to practice a lot of mindfulness while you're living there. So in, that, in a way that's quite good for us in our practice. And there's the unpredictability of the forest and the challenges of living in the forest, both the risks and just the simplicity, lack of material support. But on this occasion I was thinking of, I, I went to stay there and as soon as I arrived I noticed an ox or a cow but not the normal kind of cow you get in Australia for beef or milk but this is the typical kind of ox which is very tall with a kind of a bump on its back yeah, the sort of ox that pulls a cart um, I noticed that wandering around which, and it seemed totally out of place so I asked there was only one monk staying there so it wasn't um, a very big community. It was just a monk, simple monk, a single monk staying there. So I asked him, where did that ox come from? It looks right out of place in the jungle. And he said a couple of days before, a group of people had come out from Ganchanaburi, the nearest city, and they'd actually purchased this oxen from a slaughterhouse. It was destined to be slaughtered, but they raised funds and as an act of compassion, charity, they purchased it from the slaughterhouse and they wanted it to just live somewhere quietly, live out its old age rather than being slaughtered. So a very good thought. But perhaps they hadn't thought it through completely because they didn't know where to take it. So someone had the bright idea to bring it to that hermitage, which was right in the jungle. And there were a lot of predators around uh, particularly wild cats and wild dogs, which would attack such a creature, an ox. And I could see when I arrived that this ox was very agitated and afraid. It was trying to eat some grass, but it was always looking up and it's kind of very nervous, moving from side to side. And over the next couple of days, I was staying up in the jungle, but I'd, I'd come down to collect food with the other monk. Um, I could always noticed how afraid this oxen seems. I asked the monk, where did this ox come from? And he told me the story and he, nobody knew quite who had arranged this. It seemed like the people had just brought it and dumped it and left. And I said, this is not a very good idea because that ox is very scared. It's not happy and also there, there's predators around. It's probably not happy because it knows, it can smell or sense the predators. And an oxen usually is a more domesticated farm animal, it doesn't live in the jungle like this. Um, and then of course a few days later we got the news overnight, uh, two tigers, a large one and its smaller offspring had found the ox and chased it and the ox had run about four kilometers down, back down the track but still in the jungle and they've been chasing it and biting it attacking it and it's a big ox so ox can defend itself it's got strength it's got horns but eventually they managed to bring it down by biting uh, through a tendon on one of its back legs and it fell and it couldn't walk after that but it was still strong enough to fight them off so by the time dawn came they hadn't killed it, it was still alive 
but bleeding badly and, ble and it was bleeding to death. And there were a couple of huts, Burmese workers who worked in a tin mine not far away and they came and told us what had happened. We went to sea and the uh, cow or the ox was lying there bleeding to death, still alive and obviously very unhappy. It just had this distressed look kind of like, why, why did you do this to me? And I agreed with it. I felt very sad at the whole situation. And I went away into the forest. I think they thought I was going to the toilet, but I actually crouched down and just cried because I felt so sorry for the uh, ox that was obviously dying and dying a very miserable death. And a few days later, it was dead. Nothing could be done. But it always stuck in my mind how sometimes we do acts of compassion or charity or generosity, but if we don't think it through, it, it doesn't always lead to good results. And the Buddha actually said, when you, even when you practice dana, generosity, you need to use wisdom. And there are many ways we practice generosity, kindness, charity, compassion in the world, but it has to be guided by wisdom. Otherwise, things can go wrong. And in this case, you know, it's a tragedy. The animal's life was saved from the slaughterhouse only to be slaughtered by tigers. Um, but a good example of how we, we really need to think things through. And you learn that in a monastery. You know, sometimes people come and they want to help in different ways, but the, the help they're offering is not always appropriate or uh, the right kind of help. And that happens all over the world, of course, doesn't it? As we practice charity, sometimes it's done in an unskillful way or a, a way that can have adverse effects on the people we're trying to help and so on. So the Buddha encouraged us to, even with the practice of charity, generosity, to think it through and try and use wisdom to guide our actions. In that same place, there were other animals that were released there, but they were forest jungle animals, so it wasn't su such a problem. And, uh, and at that time, there was also a, a very young hornbill bird was released because the parents were killed by hunters, I, if I remember right. And there was the offspring was left unattended and it was still too young to fend for itself. If you know a hornbill, they're a bird that's huge. They're kind of like as big as a wedge-tail eagle and they're, they look a little bit like pterodactyls. So they're kind of like dinosaur birds. <laughs> uh, very distinctive. They've got a distinctive sound and they, in Thailand, if there are hornbills in the, in the forest, it's a sign that it must be big forest area with few people because they only stay in the most remote forest. So this young hornbill was released in the same place and it needed to be fed for the first period of its life. So it got used to the monks or the uh, people who assisted in the monastery would feed it fruit, it liked to eat fruit. And it was, but it was fine because it could fly, so it could fly out of danger. And it was in its home territory and there were other hornbills in the forest around. So it was, didn't seem very unhappy. It was, seemed quite happy, but just in need of a bit of help. So when we had our food, once a day we have our meal and we'd sit with our bowls in front of us, contemplating our food before we eat. We do it as a meditation, contemplating how much to eat and where the food has come from, with gratitude to the laity, contemplating the food as just elements to keep the body going, to try and let go of some of the attachment to taste and desire for food and so on. But while you're doing that, you're kind of <laughs> vulnerable, in a way, so the hornbill, which even though it was a baby, it was huge, a huge baby, would hop over. It wouldn't fly, it would hop. So it hop, but it hops. One hop would be maybe for a meter, so it hop 
hop, hop across the platform where we're eating and come right up to your bowl. But because hornbills, they have such a large horn bill in front of them, it's like a foot long or half a meter long or something. They can't just look into your bowl like that. Their eyes are on the side of their head. So when they want to look in your bowl to see if you've got any food, they turn and they use one eye to look into your bowl. So it's quite comic. And he would look into your bowl to see if you had anything nice. And there'd always be something there, a banana or a piece of papaya or something. But he usually wasn't bold enough to put his bill right into the bowl. He could have done that if we'd let him, but usually he waited and you pick up a piece of fruit and give it to him, mainly to get rid of him so you could carry on eating your meal. But um, he's very smart. Like if you've ever seen a hornbill in a zoo or somewhere on TV, they have a pouch underneath their bill, which is like a store pouch for food. Quite well-designed birds. So. You feed the banana to the hornbill, it doesn't eat it, it just puts it in its pouch, which is like a bag <laughs> underneath its bill. And then it says, I want more. So it stays there wanting more. And he had a very cute look, he had kind of bright eyes, and he'd open his mouth a little bit like he was smiling, and he'd sort of look at you uh, affectionately wanting more food. So then you had to give him more. So he could drain your whole meal for the day very quickly. It was quite difficult. You had to balance your kindness between being kind and compassionate for the hornbill, but also kind and compassionate to yourself. Because as monks, we only eat one meal a day and we don't have any stored food. So that brought up its own issues, but also a bit of fun. And eventually that hornbill grew up and then it just flew away and probably joined the other hornbills, found a, a mate. So that, that was okay in the forest. But the ox was a very sad story. In another place where I uh, stayed in the forest, a place called Khao Yai, um, which is a big national park a few hours away from Bangkok to the northeast, where they have beautiful forest and mountains and again a lot of wildlife. And monks like to go and stay there camping in the forest and I knew the park ranger there, so I'd go there quite often for periods to stay there and meditate in the forest. And one year, there was an animal conservation group. They were in the local market in the nearby town of Bak Chong, which is an hour or so's drive from the national park. And sometimes hunters would go into the park, catch things, and then take them to the market to sell, which is illegal, but they do it. And this animal conservation group found people trying to sell two baby bears, bear cubs. So they bought them off them to take them back to the park. But they felt they were too young to release. So again, that could have been a disaster. If they just released them in the park, they'd have probably been eaten by other animals. But they were smart enough to give them to the park ranger, who now had the problem what to do with these two bear cubs and his house was right in the middle of the park, totally isolated. Uh, so he was, a, you know, he lived there with his wife and at least several kilometers away from the park headquarters. So totally alone, surrounded by jungle and there were a lot of wild, dangerous animals around. But he was used to it and he knew bears as, as well as the other kinds of animals. So he took them on these two bear cubs and fed them milk because they were that young, that small. Uh, apparently the parent had been killed so there was no hope of re reuniting them with their parents. So he fed the bear cubs. I asked him why did you do that and he said well they had no parent, we're here, we are not afraid of animals, we understand the animals so we could do it and we took it on out of compassion. So it was just pure compassion no other real benefit to the park ranger and a lot of trouble for the park ranger because growing bears in a house, when he had to go out on his duties, he'd have to lock them in a room and they'd trash whichever room he locked them in. <laughs> and bears, even baby bears, are quite strong. 
and uh, eventually they trashed the house so much he had to keep them in an outhouse when he wasn't around. When he was there, he'd let them out to get familiar with roaming around in the jungle, but sometimes he'd have to go away on business, so he'd had to lock them up. And they just gradually became more and more destructive because they were getting stronger as they got bigger. <coughs> and one day they were so strong, they broke out of the outhouse, broke into the kitchen, trashed the kitchen looking for food as they would. <laughs> If you've ever encountered wild bears, that's mainly what they're focused on, getting food. And one of them found a biscuit tin. And if you know, in Asia, they in the market, they sell biscuits by the, in these big tins with a glass um, front. But they're big, because the idea is you keep biscuits in them for many weeks, maybe. So the one of the bears got the lid off and stuck his head in the biscuit tin and got it stuck. He ate all the biscuits, but then he couldn't get his head out. So he was very unhappy. So he walked off down the road with a biscuit tin on his head and the other bear cub followed him. I don't know if it was the him or the her, but anyway, they off, off they went down the road, wandering from side to side, howling, complaining. And so the uh, park ranger who used to go around on a motorbike, he had his walkie-talkie, they all used walkie-talkies, and he was driving along on his motorbike somewhere doing some business in the park, and he got a message that there was two bears walking down the road, one of them looking like Ned Kelly. So even Ned Kelly is famous in Thailand. <laughs> Uh, and they were kind of causing a bit of a commotion because um, the park does get visitors driving along the road and they saw the, the two bear cubs, one of them looking like Ned Kelly. So he had to drop what he was doing and go back and find them. And they're actually right next to the river and one of the, the one with the can on its head was about to fall in the river. So he had to protect it, stop it, get it back, take them home and gradually get the can off the head of the one which he didn't like. Uh, in the way wild animals are, you take a can off its head to help it, but at the same time it'll scratch you and bite you and complain. So anyway, he saved the bear from um, being Ned Kelly for the rest of his life, and then him and his wife decided that's a sign maybe they're too big and too mischievous to stay in the house anymore. So they took them off to another part of the national park a long way away so they wouldn't be tempted to come back to his house and he left them some fruit and food there and wanted them to just start adapting to the forest but out of compassion again he went and spied on them every day for several weeks just watching them to see how they spent their time he knew the area they're in and he was just concerned to make sure that they were adapting to the life in the wild without anyone helping and it seems they did gradually it took quite a few weeks so some some animals wild animals are suited to wild places and you can help them and that was a very kind thing he did domestic animals well they're suited to more domestic situations and perhaps shouldn't cross over a uh, bit like monks, sometimes forest monks go and live in the city and they're not very uh, peaceful and happy and they're thinking of the forest. And sometimes city monks go and live in the forest and they're not very happy, they're thinking of the city. Same kind of thing. <laughs> but the practice of generosity, kindness, compassion uh, is very much something the Buddha encouraged because we live in a world with billions of people, billions of animals, even insects, lots of different people and creatures. And basically we're happier if we acknowledge that there are other people around us, even animals around us. And we, you know, we share, we help each other. Because nobody in this world is isolated even though we use the word now, you, know, you go on isolation, if they think you've got coronavirus, 
they put you in isolation. But even when we say we're in isolation, we're not really in isolation, are we? We've still got people doing things for us, maybe giving us food, checking up on us, testing us. We still have uh, communications with phones and computers. We're not isolated, even in isolation. And the Buddha just said, if we acknowledge the fact that people support us and we can support others, you know, our state of mind tends to improve dramatically the more we acknowledge and respond to that. I mean, how much we respond in terms of displaying compassion for others, helping others, well, that may depend on the individual. But it has a very good effect on the human mind when we do practice compassion. We're more sensitive to others, whether it's animals or people. It brings a sense of well-being, happiness. And it's a very nourishing kind of happiness. Because it's not based on getting anything. You know, when you practice kindness, compassion, generosity, the happiness generated is internal is a, of a very pure nature, of a very wholesome nature. You're simply thinking a kind thought or doing something, putting it into action, gives us a good memory, a good feeling. It just makes, makes us feel better as human beings. And that's something you can, probably most people worked out for themselves already, but if you haven't, then it's something just to investigate and learn about and you probably find it does make you happier when you help others. The other day, uh, plumber Steve came here. He's been helping the monastery for nearly 20 years, and he came to do some work, and I had to get into his truck, and we drive across to where he had to do the work in the monastery, and he had a bag of apples, amongst other things, which I had to climb over to get into his cab of his truck. And uh, so I asked him, why have you got a bag of apples in your plumber's truck? And he said, oh, I feed the horses. I said, oh, how many horses have you got? He said, I don't have any horses. I feed other people's horses. Because as a plumber, he drives around to different properties doing work, and he often encounters horses. So when he sees a horse, he feeds it. I said, why do you feed horses? He said, it makes me happy. And that's what... The practice of compassion, kindness does, it makes us happy. And this is an important point, particularly for those interested in meditation, because in meditation we're developing a peaceful, calm state of mind based on the presence of mindfulness and other skillful qualities, so that we can understand better where stress and suffering comes from in our experience and how to abandon it, overcome it. And we need this sense of well-being because it helps to steady the mind. It has a wholesome energy with it. it helps us to put effort into developing mindfulness and to investigating the truth. It's hard to investigate suffering when you are completely overwhelmed by suffering. Not impossible, but very difficult. But if we learn to develop some of the qualities of kindness, compassion in daily life, in small ways as well as big ones, then it generates a very good feeling inside, sense of calm, happiness, well-being, that allows, it's like a platform for the mind to develop some of the qualities, the more refined qualities of, say, mindfulness um, and investigation of the Dhamma. It helps, it supports, gives the mind a very good platform for developing steadiness of mind. And when you practice meditation, even when you practice meditation, one of the reflections that can even help your mind just settle down at the beginning of a meditation is to reflect on the practice of generosity that you've done in the, the past, practice of renunciation, service, helping others, supporting others, whether in your family or your circle of friends or work or with strangers. You know, the official name is what we call Chakari, Chakanusati, 
Sati means mindfulness. Chaka means um, sacrifice, giving up. So being mindful of that which we have sacrificed or given up in the past. When we think of some of the sacrifices we've made, the good that we've done in the past, it has a good effect on the mind at that moment. It brings the mind a sense of well-being, steadies us, calms the mind. It sets the right atmosphere or the right tone for the further development of the qualities we, we are cultivating in, in the practice of meditation. So one can do it in a formal way. Sometimes you consciously think through some to certain events or actions you've done in the past to do with giving, sharing or giving up, sacrificing for others. And it tends to uplift the mind develops a more wholesome energy uh, which is a good starting point for a, a period of meditation especially if you're feeling down or stressed or unenthusiastic then it's often a good way to help you get through that at the beginning of a period of meditation even if you're and also if you're feeling experiencing some pain or discomfort from your posture which is quite common you put your mind on, on, we say, on a wholesome object when you recollect some of the things you've done in the past. And it could be the most ordinary act of kindness that maybe you overlooked, but now you're consciously bringing it up into your mind at the beginning of a meditation. So you're recollecting you know, a meal that you cooked and shared with someone, a favor you did for someone, a job of work you did that was a service to someone else. You know, if you are in a family, if you have kids or you have other people in your family you've helped, you're just remembering times when you've helped them in so many different ways, it tends to have a good effect, good psychological effect on the mind that, that is very nourishing for the development of mindfulness and developing the, your meditation. So often when we begin meditation, we, we're not doing that. We're sort of starting with the thought, I want to be peaceful. <laughs> I want to let get rid of my suffering, my stress. Or I want to attain something. I want to get samadhi. I want to get insight. I want to be a better person, wiser person. And these different um, thoughts, attitudes that are present in the mind at the beginning of meditation are often qu quite a hurdle to get over. Because we, uh, we want something. And that wanting often is, is a block to the mind settling down. Sometimes it translates into you put e too much effort into trying to concentrate your mind. So you have the thought, I want concentration, samadhi. It's a very common uh, desire amongst meditators. You know, I want a certain state of mind, a certain, of ex certain experience. And so the wanting you know, means you scrunch up your forehead and you're really trying to control your mind. Maybe you're practicing mindfulness of breathing, for example, and you put all your attention on the breath and you're not going to let your mind wander off. You've been taught you've got to be mindful of every breath in, every breath out. And the mind is fueled by this desire, this wanting of some kind of attainment that it actually, it's unnatural in both we can have a physical reaction you, know, you become physically tense get some kind of ache or pain get a headache or get tension in your body some people grit their teeth it's a very common one you ask people what your experience in meditation is and they say oh i have this terrible grinding in my teeth and it's this kind of desire to control the mind get rid of any unwanted thoughts concentrate on the breath and not let the mind go anywhere else and we're trying to do it through force and control uh, or mentally uh, it just sets up a sense a sense of mental tension uh, you might just say trying too hard at that moment so when we begin meditation you know it's important to sort of look at your state of mind you, you might have to accept Oh, when I'm meditating, I've come to sit meditation, I might have had a 
busy day, stressful day, certain things could have happened that have triggered different emotions or maybe stuff from a long time ago coming up. You have to deal with that, try and deal with that skillfully. So you have to set up the right attitude. You have to watch how you're approaching the meditation. And we've had the instruction, watch your breath, follow the breath, which is fairly simple instruction. But our attitude and how we are in that moment can vary from day to day and it can be a big obstacle. So sometimes recollecting something that brings up some joy relaxes you, brings you a good feeling, can help at that time. So recollecting acts of kindness, um, acts of generosity that we've done, or just practicing bringing up the thought of kindness for oneself, for others, wishing oneself well, wishing others well. Um, even if you are feeling stressed, angry, worried, bringing that thought up to begin the meditation helps often to calm you down and to observe the, uh, the kind of effort you're making as you begin meditating and if it's fueled by a lot of desire or ambition for results or whatever then it will often be an obstacle and it's unsustainable it's very difficult to grit your teeth and just push to make your mind a certain way for very long after a while you react with more aversion and maybe just give up so recollecting some good experiences from the past can help. Um, you focus in your mind on something good when you may also have unpleasant feelings, physical feelings from illness or tiredness, or you ha may have certain thoughts, memories coming up that are not very peaceful. But if you focus your mind on something good, it helps to balance the mind so that then you can put effort into your meditation. Another thing is like, every time you come to meditate is always a fresh occasion to get to know yourself as a human being. So again, your attitude is important. Like we're developing this quality of mindfulness, which is actually, it's an impersonal quality. It's just the quality of being aware of an object, knowing an object. So we train it by, say, becoming aware of the breath, knowing the breath. As the breath goes in, we know. The breath goes out, we know. Or the thought of loving kindness, focusing the mind on that, knowing that thought, and so on. So every time you come to do this, bring up, consciously bring up a moment of mindfulness. It's a new moment, it's a moment uh, that you can say, you know, it's untainted. If you're truly mindful in any moment, it doesn't have to be tainted by the past or the future or any other things, any other business. We're just bringing our mind to be aware of the present moment. And in that present moment, there may be impingement from around the world around us, or there may be feelings in the body and so on. But the aim is just to be mindful to drop the past, drop the future and plans and thoughts about the future and just focus on the present moment without judging oneself, others, the meditation or whatever, just to be able to know one's body and mind in the present moment. is actually a very rare experience in the course of our life. Much of the time we're caught up with our next thought, our next intention, plans of what we're going to do, or sometimes getting caught up in what we have done, regrets or longing for the past. As we're practicing meditation, we're learning to value the idea of present moment awareness. So we can learn, we can investigate the truth. And the Buddhist path is really a path of investigation learning about the truth um, within the framework of learning well what where does suffering come from what causes it and what can i do about it and the development of mindfulness and insight in meditation is is doing that very thing learning to bring the mind to the present moment pay attention 
to the mind, the body, and the present moment. Recognizing the importance of that, the value of that, and then cultivating it as a, as a skill. The skill in being mindful in the present moment. Using an object such as the breath. Um, and as we practice more mindfulness directed to the breath, then there's a chance that the mindfulness, the awareness becomes more continuous, more steady. And we see changes take place in our mind from the mind that was perhaps very distracted, uh, caught up in the past, the future, reacting to things. It starts to settle down. And that process of settling down is the mind becoming more familiar more accustomed to just being in the present moment with the breath in, the breath out, and less distracted. Your thoughts come up as you're doing this, but whereas before they're pulling you away into a multitude of stories and issues that, that um, come up, now the mind is not being pulled away so easily it's more content to stay with the breath the more you practice this, especially if you practice regularly. And it, you become more aware perhaps of the peace and the purity and the happiness that comes when your mind is mindful in the present moment. And it sounds so obvious, so easy to understand, but very difficult to experience because the mind is always moving through the power of its cravings and attachments. So it's, a, it's like a, a skill or a special kind of knowledge that you become, you're developing through your practice, just the familiarity and the skill of turning your mind to pay attention to the present moment. Whatever's going on, you may be peaceful or you may not be peaceful, your, your body may feel fine or it may feel awful, that's not the purpose. The first purpose is just to bring attention to the present moment. So that means you have to accept whatever else is in your field of awareness. So if you are very stressed or you're peaceful, your body is <coughs> um, feeling good or it's feeling pain, you're accepting that. But more it's what you're focused on is just bringing up present moment awareness as a quality of mind that you're, you're cultivating and developing the, the skill of being present in the moment or paying attention to the present moment. You could say this is one form of refuge because the more we are able to pay attention to the present moment, the more of a sense of self-control, self-confidence we'll have because our mind isn't going all over the place. And it gives rise to insight, understanding like as you practice much more meditation you're more familiar with practicing mindfulness you get to understand that everything that's coming up into your experience is based on previous causes and conditions whether you're talking about feelings or memories thoughts or feelings in the body pleasure and pain and all of this we call vibhaka karma. It's all the fruits of our past karma, our past actions. And really you can't control it because the, those past actions have been completed, they're finished. You know, the good we did in the past was good, the bad we did was bad, and it's giving its result every moment. And when I say the past, sometimes I mean it can be the... Um, recent past, like a few moments ago, or sometimes it's you know, distant past that we can't even remember. Again, we can't control that, but constantly, moment to moment, we're receiving the fruits of our past karma. And we have to accept that. So if we sit down to meditate, establish mindfulness, and we're feeling elated and happy, well, that's the fruits of our karma. If we're feeling lousy, miserable, sad, that's the fruits of our karma. If we're feeling angry, that's the fruits of our karma. Whatever has come up, we have to accept it. But then what happens next is our fresh karma. So 
So establishing mindfulness, the Buddha said, is one of the most powerful kinds of good karma you can do as a human being because it gives you the awareness, the knowledge to see what's going on. So if a memory is arising about something, a certain perception or memory is triggered, you know it because you're mindful. Then you can decide what to do with it, whether to just let it go or if it's something useful to you, you can recognize that. Or you just let it go as just a passing memory. Whether it's a thought or a feeling, a sensation or a feeling in the body. The more mindful we are, the more we can see our experience, know our experience or witness our experience. And with that you get a sense of the impersonality of our experience in the sense you know, a thought is just a thought, a feeling is just a feeling, pleasant or unpleasant, a thought can be good, bad, mundane, whatever, a memory is just a memory, a seeing is just seeing. The more we practice mindfulness the more familiar we become with this state of detached awareness where we can under, understand our experience, see it more clearly. And the Buddha gave us a method for doing this, is to investigate particularly to notice the, the three characteristics in our experience. You know, thought arising, what happens to it? Well, it passes away, it changes. It's not fixed, it's not there permanently in our mind. It will come up prompted by some past karma. It could be just a moment ago something we thought or something we said or something we did and that's prompted another thought or it could be something from outside interaction with the world or it could be something just from our distant past but it's prompted by karma it arises and if we're mindful we can see we can know it arising and then we can know it passing away because that's what thoughts do <laughs> whether it's you know the most refined amazing thought you've ever had or the most mundane ordinary thought or the most horrible thought they all have one thing in common they arise they're there and then they pass away feelings are the same pleasant feelings neutral feelings unpleasant feelings they arise they pass away of course some feelings keep reoccurring so it appears like they're constantly there but the more we put effort into developing mindfulness, the more we can observe the truth of things. Our feelings arise and pass away. And sometimes the more you maintain your mindfulness, you can, you can see that so closely and so clearly that the feeling almost dissolves and disappears by itself because you know it's impermanent. And what's impermanent, you don't have to grasp that as a self. You say it's impermanent, it's unsatisfactory, it's dukkha, because it's constantly changing, breaking up, changing. And it's not self, in the sense that it's not a permanent, controllable self. It's a, a phenomena, mental or physical phenomena, that's arising due to causes and conditions, and then changing and passing away. So as we practice mindfulness, we're observing this getting familiar, getting used to seeing thoughts arising, passing away, feelings arising, passing away. Uh, as we chant every morning, uh, or when we chant some of the Buddhist sutras, you know, form is impermanent, form is unsatisfactory, form is not self, feeling is impermanent, feeling is not self, thoughts are impermanent thoughts are not self and so on. We've chanted it many times, we've read it, we've heard it many times. But the hearing of it or the reading of it is not enough. It's a good start, but we need to actually see or know for ourselves. This is why Lumpur Chao is always talking about you know, developing this quality of just the knowing, the mind of Buddha or the mind that's with the breath, knowing the true nature of body and mind in the present moment because you're able to witness the way things are. You're no longer just thinking about things, believing things, creating stories about your experience, about the future, what we want, about the past. You're just knowing in the present moment the way things are. 
This is liberating. The more we can witness our own experience, it's liberating us from wrong views, wrong perceptions, mistaken perceptions about things. Many, many teachers in the forest tradition encourage us to develop this, what we call the internal witness. Lumbo Cha called it Siki Puto, which is a sort of amalgamated term from the Pali language, but it means the, the internal witness, where you're just watching your experience, but without getting too involved in it. It's just the same as if you witness something in the world, like a car accident or something, and someone comes along and asks you what you saw, and you just, as a witness, you just say what you saw. It's that kind of detached awareness where you're just observing, witnessing without getting involved. Because then you can see things more clearly the way they are. And you can have that sense of peace where you're peacefully observing but not getting so caught up in the stress of your own thoughts, feelings. It's particularly useful with feelings of pain because most of the time we react with aversion and distress when we get pain uh, or the unpleasant experiences we have in the world you know, with other people or things that go on in, the, in our daily life. We, we constantly we're reacting with stress and aversion to unpleasant experiences but the more we develop this internal witness gives us a chance to step back and just see things as they are without grasping hold with a sense of self. <clears throat> This is why as we practice more, then we get better at it, we get stronger at maintaining the mindfulness and then observing and witnessing the way things are and we experience more peace. If you practice regularly, then you'll probably find you can sit for longer or walk meditation for longer periods because the mindfulness is more continuous, more steady and this internal witness is, comes up more often where you're just observing and knowing things but without grasping hold and, and becoming caught up in your late, the, the latest mood that's arisen. You're seeing moods and mental states as just moods and mental states. This is where wisdom arises from the practice, if only for a few moments. Sometimes it's a much deeper, more profound thing. We are really witnessing the impermanent, unsatisfactory, selfless nature of physical and mental phenomena. And there's a real sense of the mind letting go. And liberation comes from letting go. Letting go meaning letting things be, but without grasping hold of them, clinging on to them. So it's even possible when mindfulness is there to you know, have a a really unpleasant feeling arise or unpleasant memory or a train of thought pops up into your mind that's quite unpleasant or stressful but to see it and then just let it go, let it be so it just ends right there. Lumpur Cha used to say, you know, the Buddha taught about the ending of things, the knowledge that leads to the ending of things, meaning the ending of the causes of suffering so we can be free. When we're not so mindful, we tend to always get caught up on the beginning of things. Every new train of thought, we grab, grab hold of it, we latch onto it, and it can bring us confusion and suffering of one kind or another. Every new feeling, we react to it with pleasure or with, with a, attraction or aversion, depending on its nature. You know, attraction for pleasant things can also lead to suffering because we get addicted to it and we're constantly seeking the next pleasure, the next happiness. Aversion to unpleasant experiences leads to a different kind of movement of mind, pushing away, resisting, trying to get rid of. But either way, the mind is not peaceful when we're not mindful. But when mindfulness is there and the, in, the internal witness of our experience is there, then we can just know the way things are and then let go. And this is a very private kind of internal knowledge we're developing. Even though we depend on our teachers and the Buddha and listening to the Dhamma to help us, 
in this practice, the actual knowledge of the internal witness observing things, it's a, it's a very private internal thing. It's what we call pachatang. Every day we chant on the qualities of the Dhamma. In the last quality of the Dhamma we say pachatang veditabo vinyuhi, the wise know for themselves. Ultimately, we've got to practice to develop this, this, this quality of knowing and understanding so we can free ourselves from unawareness that leads to craving, leads to clinging and attachment, that leads to suffering. And it's something that you experience for yourself. You can share what you've practiced with others and encourage others, but the actual experience is totally uh, unique to ourselves. You know, we, we free ourselves from suffering by developing the internal witness and seeing the true nature of things. You, if you can see a feeling as impermanent, then you don't grasp at it so much. It still hurts if it's a painful feeling, but at the same time you know it's impermanent. It's not really me, it's not a person, a being, it's just an impermanent feeling. It still hurts but the grasping is gone when you see it for what it is and that's where real liberation takes place so this quality of knowing supports the arising of insight wisdom clarity and the buddha encouraged us to develop it every day even on, in the practice of dana, helping the people around us, serving others, helping others, we need to do it with clarity, with this quality of knowing, looking, investigating the Dhamma, seeing what leads to what, where does suffering arise, how to end it, how to liberate the mind from the causes of suffering, whether it's the practice of dana, sila, bhavana, One's living alone, one's living with others, practicing in different situations. He encouraged us to keep developing the mind in this way. So maybe for tonight I've uh, said enough. I'll just leave you with these reflections and uh, wish you all a happy Chinese New Year. Mm -hmm.